Okay, so I'm going to start with a short history of uh, electroelasticity, and then I'm going to go over an exact solution for uh, this device, and then I'm going to go with a comparison with experiments. So this started with uh, the Curie brothers a long time ago in 1880, when they uh, discovered uh, piezoelectricity. Then, uh, eight years after that, Langevin entered the school where uh, Pierre Curie was teaching, and he immediately uh, helped Pierre Curie with uh, further his piezoelectric experiments. In 1905, uh, Pierre Curie uh, was uh, close to dying. He was deceased in the following year, and he succeeded him as professor, and then he inherited the piezoelectric laboratory that Pierre Curie had. And this device actually was invented 100 years ago, during World War I, as the invention of the piezoelectric uh, sonar. And it was invented by Langevin, and he has a patent in the year 1916, uh, in uh, France, and in the following year, he has a U.S. patent for uh, this exactly same device, which is, as described, a, a stack of sandwich quartz zinc crystals. He used quartz because at that time there was no uh, PCT, and uh, they were, uh, the stack was 15 millimeters long, which is very similar to actually the lens of the stack that you are using. And uh, it was bonded to uh, steel masses at the end. There was a head mass and a tail mass, because he realized that that's what he needed, of course, in order to have uh, maximum dis uh, displacement uh, for uh, the transducer for sonar. And also very interesting, the actual uh, natural frequency that he did his experiments at, and not just experiments, actually, he invented this in the lab, and it became uh, actual sonar for use in, in World War I, uh, right, right, uh, in a very short uh, amount of time. And uh, is, he uh, actually did uh, uh, one experiment where he had a, a ship with, uh, I think it was uh, over, um, I think it were, he had kilometers of uh, cable from it. Anyway, um, and he, essentially, the time taken by the signal to travel to the enemy submarine and echo back to the ship, that's what uh, sonar is. Uh, in World War II, we had, because of course these devices are very, very important for sonar and a number of other applications, we had the invention of ferroelectrics, mainly uh, barium titanate. I think that, that Jim also used uh, barium titanate at some point in time. And uh, 60, uh, four years ago, we had the invention of the material that is, that is uh, being used right now, which is actually even uh, older than I am, and it was invented at the Tokyo Institute of Technology in 1952. Here we have a picture of uh, the 1927 uh, Solvay International Conference, and you probably know this guy here, Einstein, and uh, to his left is uh, Pierre uh, uh, Langevin, who invented this uh, transducer, you can also see here Madame Curie and a number of very famous people, including Pauli, uh, Heisenberg, and so on and so on. So this is the Langevin ultrasonic transducer. So uh, you have here the ultrasonic sound waves into the liquid. You have the uh, tank bottom where you're using your transducer. You have a, a two masses, a head mass and a tail mass. And then you have the piezoelectric elements. Why? did he have a stack of elements? Because these are anisotropic crystals that are very, very brittle. And uh, it's, it, this, uh, they are uh, it's very fragile, and it's very difficult to make them uh, thicker than a given amount. That was the case then, it is still the case now. That's w that is the reason why you have a stack of them. So uh, this is an actual picture of uh, one that has only two, two stacks, but as I said, the original one by, by Langevin had a number of, uh, it actually was quite similar to the one you're using. This is a picture that she showed to you. There's even Langevin had a, a, the bolts. He had, uh, he had a bolt through the middle like that. 
in the, in the patent he had uh, 100 years ago, and uh, you can put the bolts outside and so on, but uh, it doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, here again we have the brass reaction mass, which is the tail mass. We have the front mass, which is in the case is aluminum, and then you have the stack. You have all these uh, crystals here. They're usually about two millimeters uh, thick. This, uh, the important thing here is that to realize mechanically you have uh, these uh, uh, crystals that you could conceive of being just a spring connected in series. And you know when you connect uh, uh, springs in series, the uh, stiffness of the stack of springs is smaller the, than the stiffness of any of them because it, it follows an inverse law, right? So the, the more springs you, the more crystals that you stack, the softer that your spring is going to be. But the electrically is connected in parallel, as, as shown here. So again, as I was saying, the, um, the connection of the, sp the, the springs mechanically is in series, so the, the, the spring stiffness is actually smaller than any of them, but the electrical is in parallel, so the capacitance add, so it's actually the addition of them. That's going to enable us actually to have an exact solution for the stack, which is very neat, because uh, when, you, when you do that, you realize that uh, the main resonant is purely mechanical. There's another uh, constitutive equation, which is you're going to see in books in piezoelectricity, where there are a couple equations if you're looking at a single crystal, like a thin crystal, but in a stack, the, where they decouple. Actually, this was uh, shown exactly by um, a scientist at uh, US uh, Naval Research Lab in San Diego about uh, 1963, and his name was uh, Gordon Martin. I think he's still alive, actually. And it's important also to realize uh, the difference between an electromagnetic shaker. You may be familiar with these devices. They are huge. They're used to, uh, for example, if you want to, have, uh, to look at an airplane uh, wings, for flatter, they are bent like that, you use an electromagnetic shaker, or if you want to, to uh, do vibrations, they are able to have very large stroke, very large displacement, but they are very limited on the force. That's why they are huge. And actually the force is even smaller than you're going to find in this shake in this uh, device that Jim is using, because uh, the, the force in an, an electromagnetic shaker goes like this. It's important to realize that the force in a piezoelectric shaker is actually can be quite large because it depends on the elastic modulus, which is the stiffness of those springs. And those are very stiff. When you have a material, you have very high stiffness. You don't have that when you use it just an ele electromagnetic shaker. The problem is, is that uh, the displacement is quite small because these are stiff materials. And, and uh, you, you can have a trade-off, actually, for many applications. Nowadays, we are using uh, for uh, uh, polymer uh, piezoelectric materials, which have large displacement but small forces. Actually, that so nowadays you, you can actually this piece of shaker thing actually could be cover all these things because there are all kinds of materials that have been invented. Okay, so looking at the phase diagram. You have a temperature, which is called the Curie temperature, above which you don't have any electroelastic or piezoelectric uh, properties, and the piezoelectric properties are below the Curie temperature. The materials that are being used here, for example, the uh, PCT, it sits somewhere here, it has a tetragonal symmetry, and um, if you look here, lead, uh, so come in here, and here, here you have titanium, it is about this, uh, um, about 52%. Now, the, here is actually how the formula. There are, there are mainly two versions, a hard form and a soft form. I think that Jim has used both of them. If you look at the equations, it's, it's obvious that the only one, that, they, that the one that you want is the hard one, 
because the modulus of elasticity is much higher. You want to have a higher force as possible. So that, that, that tells you that SM11, the hard one, should be better. It also has a Curie temperature, which is about twice as high. So it's very bad to use a material that has a low Curie temperature, particularly when you have thermal effects. So that's a big no-no to use a material like that. And uh, this is the, the piezoelectric constant that uh, gives you the, the inverse piezoelectric effect, which is the displacement as a result of voltage. This will make you look, oh, this is, this is very good. It's twice as much. But when you take into account very low Curie temperature, uh, softer, and here you have the kiss of death. For this, is, for this device to work, you're, you have to be in resonance. The quality of resonance is measured by an inverse of damping measure called the quality factor. The quality factor, just for the piezoelectric crystal itself, for the hard one, is 1,800. <laughs> for, the, for the soft one, it's only 60. So just, it's full of damping. Uh, you, you can see it's going to go nowhere. It was tested, and it went nowhere. So that, 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 makes, that, makes, that makes sense with theory. So uh, this is a paper that was published in 2014, just two years ago. They have a better understanding now of the phase diagram of PCTs. You know, they have been around for 64 years, but they're used for transducers all over the place. So, uh, so I want to show you where this material that Jim is using is, is sitting, which is somewhere here. And I want to show you the fact that the, actually the other phase diagram, which is in a book, is wrong because they show uh, a phase here which actually has been shown not to exist. Okay, now we uh, go to where Heidi left off, which is the hoyle narlikar theory, which is, uh, if you look at the paper, you were asking about the Lagrangian, the action is right there. It's actually, they, they go at a great length to describe the action and it is all on mass points. So in the, in, in the papers of Hoyle Narlikar, which is about same, and actually I would say more of them, because Narlikar is still alive and is still publishing. He has papers even up to now. But uh, again, I completely agree with Heidi. His, his, their notation is horrible, and uh, the best thing maybe is to go to the book, uh, which is actually not, not that great. Anyway, so this is the equation. The, uh, the change in the mass density, uh, I'm using SI units, uh, is uh, proportional to these two terms. I don't think that there's uh, I, any need to separate it into impulse and wormhole terms unless you want to describe them because mathematically, obviously, this is just the second derivative with respect to time of the log of m. So they, uh, why separate them and neglect one when you, when you can take both of them into account like that? And you can go, uh, derive this then from then on here uh, clearly by uh, taking into account the relativistic definition of kinetic energy, which is like this. And then plug this in here, in, and then you have the... Um, uh, rest mass plus the kinetic energy divided by the square of the speed of light. And then you get these two terms. Is there a derivative of the rest mass? Or? Yes, the quantity all over the place. The whole gym theory is based on a variable rest mass. That's how the, the whole effect comes about. So, we assume uh, speeds that are of the material points, which are much lower than the speed of light. Certainly in these experiments, the, uh, that, that, that goes without saying. If you look at what the PCT, uh, uh, which is used for sonar since about 100 years ago, certainly much lower than the speed of light. And therefore, it's clear that then the kinetic energy uh, is just one half of the rest mass times the velocity squared. And therefore, the log of 1 plus that, then you get this. Then if you assume that the kinetic energy is of the PCT, PCT stack is much smaller than the rest mass times, the, times C, C squared. We're not going to have any nuclear explosion or, or, or hydrogen bomb going into the PCT stack. So obviously, the kinetic energy of this experiment is 
completely negligible compared to, to E equal mc squared. It follows that you get this. And finally, this is a more tricky assumption if you go through the mass. You have to assume that the second derivative with respect to time of the log of the rest mass is much smaller than the second derivative with respect to time of the kinetic energy with respect to mc squared. Now, so essentially, yes, you're assuming that there is a variable rest mass, that those changes are very small, and actually it is the change with respect to time of the log of the rest mass, which you're assuming to be very small. So you then essentially you get this very simple equation, which is the change of the uh, mass density is just uh, due to the derivative with respect to time, this, uh, the second derivative with respect to time of the kinetic energy, the only assumption being whole gnarly current and advanced waves, uh, speeds of the material points much lower than the speed of light, and that the change in variable uh, mass with respect to time is uh, smaller than the change of the kinetic energy, which is also easy to show. So the kinetic energy is what? Just a little motion? Exactly. Okay. Yes. I want to show you that. So the interesting thing here is to notice that it is the second derivative with respect to time of the kinetic energy. And you know that the kinetic energy is mv squared. So if you're taking the first derivative, derivative, you get acceleration. You get the second derivative is the jerk. And the jerk is very important because it has been shown mathematically. This is actually was shown only like uh, two or four years ago that a lot of people are interested in complexity and um, nonlinear dynamics, that an equation that has a jerk is equivalent to the system of three first order nonlinear differential equations. And that is the minimal setting for solutions that can show chaotic behavior. So this stack can show, theoretically can show chaotic behavior. And re remember that as we go along. Because, because it involves the derivative with respect to time of the acceleration. Now, as a simple model of the experiments or of this device in a spaceship, obviously you, can, you cannot clamp it to anything, so consider it as you consider uh, when you analyze a spaceship or even analyze uh, an airplane as free-free, having a, uh, two mass, unequal masses with a spring connecting them and a dashboard in between where all the internal losses are going. So again, you have the two masses, and here you have the spring and the dashboard, which is your piezoelectric stack, and otherwise it's free-free. You may ask me, well, what about this? Because uh, when I like it, I can show you that it is negligible because the stiffness of, you know, the stiffness of anything in uh, uniaxial uh, tension or compression is much, much more than if I wanted to bend this, I can bend it very, very easily because this thing is very thin. So actually, if you analyze this, it's going to be a much lower natural frequency, so it's decoupled because when you go over a natural frequency, then the motion is much smaller. Anyway, we have shown this uh, experimentally as well. So um, you set up the equations for uh, a simple, uh, system of two masses with uh, damping and unequal masses. And uh, you look at the center of mass because we want to be interested in the force. And remember that the force is related to the mass that times the, the center of mass times the. It, so, in order to save time, I'm not going to go over the whole thing. But I wanted to go over this. Consider masses that are variable with time. And again, assume that they change. Here you have to make this assumption, which is the change in the uh, with respect to time of the mass is much smaller than the change with respect to time of the displacement, uh, the, log, the, the log form of it. So it's sort of a log velocity. The, in, other, in, other, in other words, you're saying that the changes in variable mass, again, are very small. And uh, you go through this, and actually um, defining um, 
Q being, uh, that comes actually if you do, uh, uh, if you like Lagrangian analysis, if you do a Lagrangian analysis, one uh, generalized coordinate that comes right away, when you look at the system of two masses that are with the spring in different uh, natural mode, they are doing this. It is just the change in length between the two masses. And because the first, the first mode of the is, is, are the two masses going like that, in and out. So the interesting thing is where does the change in mass go with respect to time? It goes into the damping term. Now, I, I'm taking into account damping, but many people, in order to simplify things, uh, neglect damping, which is very wrong because otherwise you get the ridiculous things because at resonance you get infinity if you, if you neglect damping. But you have to be very careful with this because uh, if the, this change in variable mass is not small with respect to damping, and you're going to get there because we want to have as high as Q as possible. The higher the Q, the lower the, the, lower the damping. So when you're, going, when, you use, when you're using very high Q devices, then this term becomes very important. What does this term do? If you are, are familiar with uh, 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 flatter of uh, airplanes, which brought a lot of planes down between World War I and World War II, it's an aeroelastic instability. It can give you a self, uh, self excitation. First of all, it gives you a parametric excitation because if, if this is changing with time, like a cosine or, or a trigon trigonometric, uh, trigonometrically, then it it's going to excite the system parametrically. But more importantly, if this is goes negative, then you have neg and, and this is bigger than this, you have negative damping. Now, you're familiar with damping as far as damping a vibration being a positive damping because energy comes out. Systems that have negative damping, they actually the vibration grows exponentially. That's what flatter is. When, when you have uh, airplane wings that are not um, uh, into uh, delta V enough, actually if you were to have, for example, uh, airplane wings made out of aluminum and they are uh, forward like this, actually they're going to start to vibrate and the, f and the airflow is going to act like negative damping and they're eventually they're going to break. So this uh, device is capable of chaotic motion and it also due to variable mass, it has the ability to have a lot of damping, not only from damping itself, but also from the variable mass. And the variable mass also, if you could engineer it, also could produce a, a, a self-excitation, which is actually, I think, what you want to do here. So, anyway, so here I go back and um, I look at the excitation for the um, piezoelectric material and uh, the piezoelectric excitation here, this is a strain, this is a voltage, and, the and this is the electric field. So the electric field is equal to the voltage divided by the thickness of the, of the uh, crystal disk times the piezoelectric constant. There is another uh, effect called the electrostatic electro effect, which goes like the square of the voltage. And that has a, uh, another material property, which is uh, I'm calling here by the tensor M33, and this one, piezoelectric, this is 3. So if you have a voltage like uh, Jim does in his experiment, that is a tri uh, varies like a, a trigonometric function, like a cosine, for example, you know that the square of a cosine gives you a term that goes like cosine 2 omega t, and it gives you a constant term. So you end up with a constant term, a term that goes proportional to the cosine omega t and a term that goes proportional to cosine of 2 omega t. 
So this is piezoelectric and that is electrostrictive. That's purely due to the material properties. It has nothing to do with whether you like to excite it or not. These materials are both piezoelectric and electrostrictive. So you have electrostrictive stat the uh, electrostrictive static term, one, uh, an electrostrictive term that goes like uh, two omega, and you have the piezoelectric effect. The, the static term gives you a, a, a trivial solution that doesn't vary with time, so we're not interested in that unless you wanted to characterize. Actually, you could measure what the uh, electrostatic uh, constant is from that experiment, from looking at the uh, static property. But just let's take a look at what's happened during the vibration. So, didn't give uh, an electrostatic constant at all in their, in their data. So that's actually a way that we could calculate doing an experiment. Yes. Actually, it's very difficult to find. I found that something like four references that, uh, that give you the electrostatic constant. And likely enough, the material that Jim is using, that where he gets the highest force, it is one of the uh, best known and most characterized forms of PCT. The, the supplier calls it SM111, but it's well known in the trade as PZT4. And actually, actually the supplier itself says in parentheses PZT4. So if you go uh, and look for PZT4, there are a very few uh, references that, that uh, do give you this. So uh, I'm not going to have enough time to go in detail into this, but actually uh, defining an undamped natural frequency. Uh, I had to take into account also the bolts. Why are the bolts there, by the way? The bolts are there again from the very beginning because even Langevin realized, I have a material here that is very brittle. It's, what does that mean? It's full of cracks. It cannot take any tension. You know, even, even the Romans, when they made buildings or bridges, they realized they couldn't use rocks to make a skyscraper. So the only way that you can make a building with a rock is to put it in compression, because comp uh, compression closes the cracks. So uh, in order to put a pre-compression, you use this bolt in order to apply tension on it, which is what Heidegger has been doing. You can put a central bolt, you can put bolts on the periphery. Anyway, they affect the natural frequency, but they don't affect the excitation. So you have to take that into account that you're, you're going, to, with the bolt, you may end up with a, a stack that has a higher natural frequency, but if it, if it is purely as a result of the bolt, it's not going to give you a greater force. So you have to be very careful when people start talking about uh, this goes like the frequency and so on. Yes? So uh, when you have the whole system together with the bolts, the, the masses, and the stack, based on what you were saying right here about the harmonic, does, does, it, does that excitation characteristic change with thermal differences? Such yes. as if you run this thing for a long time and it heats yes. up for yes. 10, it, 15 it, seconds, it, how does that change your and it, it, Yes, frequency? and it changes with history. Sorry? With history. Yeah, yeah. It has, it has an, an electrical, it's an electrical history. It changes due to the fact that it's a very brittle material and you're going to get sh shear cracks. Mm -hmm. But w all you are doing with the bolts is uh, uh, actually closing cracks but you still have a shear motion and you're going to get fatigue. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll go over that in, in detail. So there's a lot of things to do that you have to take into account. Yes? How do you determine how much pressure you need to put on a bolt? Excellent. The, the, it should not be on a torque basis. It should be on the base on the stress. That's what matters. So uh, you, should, you should do an engineering analysis, either do a closed form solution, or which I think is a very simple geometry, one can do that, or do a finite element analysis, which is right nowadays, nowadays most uh, <laughs> engineers take the easy way out and then they don't want to think about it and then just run the drawing and then they run the finite element analysis, boom, I get, I get, the, I get the stress. But you should always run into the same, st uh, the, the same stress. And um, theoretically, it should be done taking into account fatigue. That is a very involved subject. More people don't know about it. You could take an empirical point of view, at least, do a few experiments. Would this work? As you, as you change the cross-section of, of, of your stack, 
you should take that into account and always run it with the same stress and to those insisting always to have the same torque. So on that note, on that note if you run you know, a particular stack under a particular bolt stress, I'm not going to say torque, but under a bolt stress, you run it for a while, you develop these uh, compression shear cracks within the crystals, you, know, you let it cool down, whatever. Do you have to go back and retighten to kind of close those new cracks? I, 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 I have a, a couple of slides at the end. I think there's a better way to do this, yeah. which is to run impedance spectroscopy. Okay. You run an impedance spectroscopy, you, on the vertical axis you have impedance, on the, on the horizontal axis you have a spectro, uh, the frequency. How long does it take you? Try to keep it at a constant level between runs. How long does it take you to run? A, it, it, it puts noise into two, the device. Two seconds, two it takes two seconds. 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 In two seconds, you get all the information you want. I, can, I will show you. You get, you get the natural frequencies. And actually, I can tell from what she has been running that the level of damage that she has in this of these stacks and why they are given lower forces. And I can, uh, you, I can see a huge difference. Uh, and, and if you're interested, I'll show you that later on. But anyway, so you get these um, long equations here. It's obviously, you cannot read, but I want to show you. But I want to show you that <laughs> that the uh, uh, piezoelectric. F I, I, there are two terms that I want to show. One that is in phase, one that is out of phase. You get an out of phase term because you have damping. Damping gives you an out out of phase. So the in phase term, piezoelectric has a term that goes 1 minus omega divided by the natural frequency omega naught. When omega equals omega naught, then that is resonance. The other, the other term doesn't, doesn't have that, uh, which is the out of phase term. 1 over Q. Remember that no damping is infinite Q. So 1 over infinity is 0. So the whole term is 0 when you have no damping. So all you have is this term, which is the, reso the resonance term. This is due to damping. This term, the whole thing is multiplied by 1 over Q. Why? Because this is the out of phase term. So that's, that's the one that you get here, 1 over Q. Doing the same thing for the, oh, but you can decompose this in uh, the solution, even though it's a, in, in a sense it's a nonlinear problem because it goes like the square of the voltage. Thanks to Fourier, we know that uh, you can, when you have the uh, square of a cosine that's cosine to omega, you can decompose it, and therefore you can add these terms. So you can use superposition, so you can have one, sol one solution for the piezoelectric terms, another one for the electrostricted terms. So the electrostricted terms, if you look at the they look like this, or oh, they have these terms that are proportional here to the unequal masses, goes like 2 omega over omega naught. Now, the excitation is at 2 omega. That doesn't mean that you're going to get a resonance at 2 omega. No, you get the resonance at the subharmonic frequency, which is half omega. That's typical of uh, nonlinear resonance. Why? Because you need to have. 2 omega equals omega naught. And that, when does that happen? When omega equals to 1 half. So the electrostrictive resonance happens at half the frequency of the um, piezoelectric one. So um, you continue with the derivation by uh, now computing the force, which is equal to the total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. So we have to calculate the acceleration of the center of mass, taking into account not only the obvious terms that, that are due to the acceleration, but the terms that are due to the variable mass. And when you do that, actually, I, I like to uh, spend some of my time in a forum, and there's a lot of people coming from everywhere that, that they say, <laughs> they talk about physics, and they say, uh, there's no way that a, uh, a system in outer space can uh, accelerate itself uh, with, uh, without having an external force. And I say, well, how do you know that? And said, because nowadays there's a lady that is in fashion, and what's her name? That has a, a, a theorem uh, uh, that everybody likes to quote. 
about the cons conservation of, uh, uh, that leads to conservation of momentum, and therefore you can say, no, you cannot have a force. Actually, that's completely wrong. That's only true for a system that has no damping. It is easy to show, actually, that you have a term that is a f an inertial force on the center of mass due to damping and unequal masses. If you have equal masses, then this term drops, up, drops out. If you have uh, zero damping, this term drops out. But if you have unequal masses with damping, you're going to get a force on the center of mass. It's just not going to be a uniaxial force. All that's going to happen is that your center of mass is just going to move back and forth. But this happens all the time. If you look at this uh, a spacecraft that was going around Mercury, and you, you get these vibrations in outer, in outer space with a, with a spaceship going out there. Or all you, what you cannot have without having something like Jim's uh, theory is a uniaxial force. But it's very easy to have a vibration where you vibrate the center of mass, even though it's free, free, floating out in space, and it doesn't have any external forces if you're just, just able to vibrate it. Anyway, so you have this term, but it's not going to be interesting to us because all this is going to do is just going to move the center of mass back and forth. And then you have these terms that are due to variable mass, which are the terms that are going to give you the, the force uh, responsible for the Mach effect. And again, you can systematically, uh, uh, if you consider f that the change in variable mass is small enough and that the, the rest mass has, has not uh, changed very much because you're not having any atomic or uh, hydrogen explosions, at least in this st stack, then uh, you end up with uh, uh, a Mach effect force that is composed of two terms. One that uh, is proportional to omega-6, which is just what Heidi had calculated uh, by more uh, simple terms in previous papers, and it's, you, it's due to terms that go like sine omega squared times cosine of 2 omega t, and so on. And that gives you a unidirectional force. And Remember those very large equations that I had for M and N, which are a function of the resonance, and they took the whole thing? Well, each of these terms have those things. And you have, uh, I think it was 20 of these terms. Yeah, there are 20 terms there. There, so it's, it's, it's exact, but it's a lot of computations. The the, all this thing, drop to zero if you have equal masses. One of the great things that I saw in Heidi's paper was she went to a conference and I said there was, she talked to somebody and said, why don't you run your experiment with equal masses? That guy was great. Yeah. Because was it was at Huntsville, Alabama, Alabama, and I was wondering whether it, was, it, was, it wasn't you. Uh, I can't remember who it was now, but uh, that we, we wrote a paper. We did, in fact, get a null result, so it, it's predicted by the theory. OK, so there's another term, which is there because, unfortunately, you get, you get when you compute the, the uh, change with time of the center of, of mass, you get this term that, uh, that is a high order term that is proportional to the uh, derivative with respect to time square. So you end up with 269 terms, which I'm not going to show you because there is not enough uh, paper there, but I, I calculated them. They're in my program. And it, the terms, each term is composed of five factors, M, M, and N. M is in phase, out of phase. And the terms can go uh, like this, for example. It can be an in phase term due to the electrostricted term that goes like 2 omega to the cube times an out-of-phase term and another out-of-phase term that are due to the piezoelectric effect. This is due to mass one, this is due to mass two. That's what the subspace mean, the unequal mass, remember. And you have other terms like that. Okay. So fortunately here, we're done. So you have now this exact solution, which is uh, exact under very well-known specified assumptions, where, which is, again, the, the speed of the material points is much lower than the speed of light. 
and that your uh, change in variable mass is small enough compared with the kinetic energy, and you calculate that. Ten minutes, uh, ten minutes great. So uh, uh, if you do a calculation for a typical stack that uh, Jim has been running, then, and I, here just for curiosity's sake, I want to look at the electrostatic resonance which occurs at half the natural frequency, which is the one that he's interested in because it's much larger, then you see it's there, but it is at, these are micronewtons, so uh, this is at thousands of a micronewton, so it's only like um, uh, 2.8 uh, nanonewtons, and, and it's actually uh, slightly uh, asymmetric, but that, that resonance is there, but it's extremely small. So the main, the main one that you're interested in is this one. This is actually what I think you have been measuring. So again, here in the vertical axis, you have the, the Mach, effect, uh, Mach effect force, and here you have the frequency, and I have gotten very close to the, uh, to the resonance. And positive means that you have a force towards the small mass. And negative means that you have a force towards the big mass. So as you approach the natural frequency, the force is towards the big mass. And it reaches a peak of only 2.6 micronewtons, which is uh, very close to what uh, Jim and Heidi have been measuring. And they have been measuring a force which is toward the big mass. What I want to show you is that, however, if you, when you do the calculation, you see that suddenly, the force reverses direction. That means it has to decelerate. And the force at resonance is much larger. It can be like 17 micronewtons instead of two. But you're not going to measure that because if, you're st if you don't have automatic frequency control, you're doing this with an operator, and you're coming here, and you're trying to reach uh, resonance, and this thing is, is resonating here, it's already moving back and forth, so it's not going to all of a sudden sh shift direction and hit your resonance. So if you really wanted to have a great force, you're going to have to have automatic frequency control instead of having operators. And like you said very well, this is a thermal effect. Due to the thermal effect, you have an expansion. That changes the natural frequency, which means that this thing is going to be moving. And, and also, this thing is very, very narrow. This occurs over a uh, width that is less than one uh, half Q bandwidth. Now, let's plot what's going on here, uh, force versus uh, mass, because Heidi was passing around the brass mass to people, and when they were asking, what is that? that, you know, that's, that's, there are two masses. There's a big mass, which is the brass mass, and there is a small mass, which is the aluminum mass. So let's play with the, the brass mass. That's what they did. And they found out empirically that actually there was an optimal mass. If you, uh, and if you look here at changing the mass uh, of that uh, brass mass, you will see uh, in the calculations that there is this peak here, and that's where the optimal uh, mass occurs. But even for Mathematica, taking uh, uh, 500 points, on the, which is non-standard, the standard one is less than 100 points, it's very difficult to calculate this because, again, this, the, the force peak occurs over a very, very narrow uh, bandwidth. And this force is towards the, the small mass. Go ahead. There's there completely artificial due to computation. Okay. It doesn't occur, not occur. If, uh, if I were to plot it with more points, it's not finding them because, because the resonance is occurring over a very, very small bandwidth. So if you were varying the brass mass, but leaving the aluminum mass constant. Exactly. So it, doesn't, it just matters on the ratio of those masses. Exactly. Got it. So um, now uh, looking at uh, here again, it's towards the uh, small mass, and this is towards the, the uh, big mass, and it looks like this. Let's flip it around to see what I think, what Jim and Heidi are actually measuring. 
They are not measuring what could be the force. They are measuring what is easy to get, which is very small, so you can barely see it here, this ripple here. But if you were to do this with automatic frequency control, I think you will, will be able to have a significantly larger force. So on that automatic frequency control, what would be the feedback to control it? Uh, let's discuss that later. Okay. So uh, I want to, uh, to show you uh, uh, the calculate uh, the natural frequency versus uh, experiments. These are the experiments, and this is the calculation. Take into account that this is an exact um, solution. It's not finite element in an answer like that. That's really good uh, calculation. That's massive, and the natural frequencies are plotted. Those red dots are our, our results, and the blue line is, is his calculation. So it is, it's uh, actu actually a simple calculation with just two unequal masses, a spring and a dashboard can, can, can get you most of the way to where, where you want to be. Now, uh, let's take a look at this uh, variation of... So you we'll probably bring it home, or... Uh, we're getting, we're getting to... much more to go? How much time do I have? Like, one Nothing? minute. Just a few minutes. Nothing? Okay. I wondered, uh, it seems like we're okay. getting deeper and deeper. I wonder, you know. All right, let's, let's, let's uh, discuss one more thing here, which is important, and then uh, I'm done, which is... I ask myself, and I wonder why you didn't ask yourself, you, you have, in, for example, designing this spaceship to go to uh, the planet that was uh, uh, recently discovered uh, and into uh, Proxima Centauri uh, in order to go and take some measurements. And uh, let's say that you have the mass tax over here, but uh, you are passing around this brass mass, which is only a few grams, I think it is, uh, what is, um, less than 100 grams? Around there. Yes, about 80, 80 or 90 grams. But my spaceship is not going to be 80 or 90 grams, it's going to be uh, many kilograms. So what happens to the Mac, to the Mach effect force? Does it disappear? Oh my God, what is, what, what is it works only for very small masses? That would, that would be really bad. So uh, fortunately it does not disappear but it does get uh, much smaller. And again, I want to show you that the whole thing of the optimal, uh, optimal mass, I don't have, I didn't have the time to show you, it depends very much at what frequency you're measuring this. It's not a, a universal constant. It depends on how close you're getting to the resonant frequency, what that optimal mass is. The one that will give you a peak here, for example, is that's what's so bad about doing experiments in the lab without having the whole theory, for a spaceship, it will give you zero force because when, if you stop at that, uh, at that frequency, which is 2Q away, uh, sorry, 1 over half, 1 over 2Q away from the resonant frequency, for a spaceship, it will give you zero force. So either you have to be at a frequency far enough from the resonance for a big, for a big spaceship, or you have to be at resonance, and at resonance, you get the big force, but the big force is in the opposite direction to what you will measure. <laughs> so you're measuring the, the big force toward the, uh, toward the brass mass, and actually at resonance is occurring in the opposite direction. I'm uh, sorry, but I only have a few more seconds, so I want to end up with the conclusions. So basically, there is excellent comparison between theory and experiment for the natural frequency. We also get the correct sign of the force towards the big mass for frequencies that are not too close to the resonant frequency. I, 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 I just have predicted. Also, just have predicted the force toward the big mass. Uh, this, this remains to be demonstrated. Uh, uh, I calculate that uh, reverse direction. Uh, I correctly model the optimal mass to maximize force at given if you're far enough from the, from the frequency that as, as I calculated this uh, brass mass as you pass around, it's about uh, uh, 0.08 grams or 0.09 grams. For a spaceship, which has a much greater mass than in experiments, then the, the force is considerably smaller, but it, that, it does not disappear if you are careful about doing your frequency control. So you can get a real force. 
And one more thing here, uh, presently I need to use a, a coupling factor of 0.4%. I don't have the time to discuss over this. I'm not happy with, with uh, coupling factors, although they are common in piezoelectric analysis, because I uh, really think from my experience in nonlinear analysis for spaceships and, and aircraft when I was at MIT, that this effect that, of the variable mass that is in the dumping should not be put under the rug so easily. It may be there, and I think that the reason why you're getting a very small force is due to the variable mass that uh, is giving you an artificial damping which is significantly greater than the damping of the material. And this has a promise that if it is so, that if one can model the nonlinear dynamics and then take in, into account parametric excitation or even better self-excitation so that I could use the variable mass to have uh, effective negative damping, then I could have a huge mega force, which is what we really want. So uh, you were asking me about uh, the test. I, I discussed uh, running impedance spectroscopy and uh, I wanted to show you here uh, we compare, uh, for example, a very thin bracket with a large bracket. And this is uh, impedance, you, you put your, uh, your stack into an impedance spectroscopy device. So you measure impedance versus frequency, and you get a curve that, that goes line, down like this because the piezoelectric uh, uh, crystals are mainly capacitors. Really. So capacitance goes down with frequency, and you get that. You get these uh, peaks here that uh, hardly move, that are purely due to inductance. They are electric effects, so we don't, we don't uh, care about that. This is the first natural frequency, and this is the second natural frequency. So from this test, you can get the, the natural frequency before you run your Mach effect force. In this case, it should be about 32 hertz. But in, for this stack, which was uh, PCT4, it's M11, but it was a weird stack. For some reason, they had used eight crystals that were one millimeter joined in the middle to four crystals that are two millimeters. And if you look at what's going to happen with that, you have a one millimeter crystal next to a two millimeter crystal, and you do an analysis of the electrolytic effect there because you have to take into account the crystal also has a shear deformation as well. Then you're going to have a significant stresses at that, at that joint. If you run it enough times, I don't think it's going to do very well even if you run it once, but run it enough times, I, I predict that you're going to get a crack first at that joint. That joint is in the center of the stack. Okay, yeah. it, just one more thing. Uh, the, the, the second natural frequency is, uh, has the center of the stack moving back and forth. So it's not much affected even if it would be debonded there. And actually that's what we found. The second natural frequency is not much affected at all. The first natural frequency is, is affected. So I could tell from the analysis Natural frequency is much lower than what it should be. Aha, there is damage here. It's a crack, it's a crack a stack. And I know it's, where, is, where is the crack? It's crack in the center because the second natural frequency didn't move. Okay, thank you. I'm done. Considering the mass of the balance, we are just considering the mass of the breast. Can this be decoupled from the rest of the statue? I, I, I took a very serious analysis, uh, look at that from the point of view of the vibration problem. And I think that uh, either by design or by luck, the, the bracket there is extremely important. It has to be thin enough so that the natural frequency of the stack 
uh, supported by the bracket, the bracket is able to bend back and forth and gives you a natural frequency which is much smaller than the 32 kilohertz. When you have a, then a, a natural frequency which is much smaller than 32 kilohertz, you have a effective decoupling. Now probably you're going to ask me, how much more does it have to be? I would say at least by a factor of two. And it's, it's easily uh, uh, much lower than that. And um, convinced, we, we ran um, a stack that had a bracket made out of thin aluminum that uh, was so thin, at my request, Heidegger was worried because he could bend it and so on. Let's run it. It made no difference in the, in the, uh, in the impedance spectrum. No difference whatsoever. I can show you the graph. So that tells me that the uh, bracket is not influencing at all the natural frequencies of the stack, even of a damaged stack, which is, is a more sensitive stack than a, than, a, than a one that is not damaged. What yes. is your bolt made out of? Is it brass? The bolt that's pulling the stack together. Oh, the stainless steel. It's stainless steel. There's yeah. six of them, right? There's actually six, four 40 volts and there's six 256 volts. Okay. The 440 volts are bolting the brass mass to the, to the L bracket. Okay. And the 256 volts are the ones that you see wrapped in, in the heat shrink or, or surrounding the stack mm -hmm. rooms into the brass mass. The brass mass is threaded all the way through. Okay. So, uh, where is your big problem? Your big problem in thermal expansion is, is in the BCT stack itself. Am I correct? The problem with the thermal expansion is mainly the fact that due to thermal expansion, you have the natural frequency that is shifting. And the Mach effect force that you're measuring is extremely sensitive to it. Even right now, they cannot get close enough. And if, you're, if you have a moving target, it's even worse. That is the main problem. Second problem after that, I would say damage. You want these things to last a long time. And uh, uh, fatigue is very bad. And if you, uh, when you, not only you have the uh, electromechanical effect of the piezoelectric stack going back and forth like that, you also have thermal effect. It's very bad because the material properties of this material, remember, are temperature dependent, mm -hmm. and they have a Curie point where they even completely lose all their electric properties. And believe it or not, if you take a look at uh, just a few degrees going up in temperature, your uh, fatigue life can be uh, very much affected. So uh, there's this. Also thermal soak into the brass. Sorry. There's also a thermal soak back into the brass, since there's no cooling mechanism. Excellent. I can be. I, I think that that's one way. I uh, think that I like to move is that uh, we have to take heat away from the inside and the outside, yeah. because right now, the, right, well, right now it's only being taken away from the from the ends, which is very bad. Now, there are many things to study here which are really questioned. One of them is using the, the stack. It has historical reasons and so on. You don't want to have a single, crypt, a single crystal, of course, or even two. I can show you for a number of reasons. But having uh, eight two millimeters or 16 one millimeter may be too much. This, we have to study how about six, how about four, and so on. That, there's a lot of things that have to be studied, yes. Um, hang on just a second. <coughs> we are running a little bit lo uh, late, uh, so we have some coffee brought in. Maybe we should have maybe a, at least a five-minute break just to calm down a bit. Maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs>